Okay, so hi, Vinicius. Thanks a lot. Thanks Hello, for being here with us. Thank How's you. How's everything? So uh, you, 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 you gave a uh, talk about microservices. Can we just start talk, like having a very brief discussion about what microservice is and why it's important? All right. So microservices is another architectural pattern that is emerging in the uh, <coughs> latest years. Mm -hmm. And the uh, basic idea behind it is to decompose the existing systems in the smaller parts or uh, build new applications uh, based on services that will compose together functionality. Right, and everyone says that, you know, when, once you're doing microservices, we, we, have, we have a track here today talking about DevOps. Right. And, you know, uh, once you, you decompose your application or you start a new application with several uh, services running, it's, it's reasonably more complicated to deploy, to maintain, to keep those things up and running, everything. So can you actually do microservices by hand, or you have to automate a lot of things and have to do DevOps, really? You can do that by hand, but it's going to be always more difficult for you to maintain an application like this. Right. So uh, DevOps and microservices, they walk together, uh, because if you have a good DevOps culture in your team, uh, like automating everything, developing microservices and adding new services becomes easier for you. Right. So you have this question that everyone, you know, microservice is like this big buzzword right now. And so a lot of times when you talk about microservice, you have those guys that, you know, they have uh, like a large monolith applications that they still have problems in deploying. You know, they can't, they, they don't have the whole thing automated. Uh, they still have problems of deploying. They still have problems of doing, uh, 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 you know, uh, a, a, a zero downtime deployment, for example. And then they say, oh, I'm going to do microservice. So that's just going to get... Even crazier, right? Yeah. Uh, you always have to evaluate if you need to use microservices or not. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, it's more easy for you to deploy a single application. Right. Now, Even so, th so that's, that's kind of the, the, right. the complicated part, right? Yeah. Now, what are the benefits of microservices? Right? If, if you actually do a, a something in microservices, you automate everything, why that's better? Well, there are several... Uh, there are several advantages you can point out. One is uh, you don't need to be uh, tied to a single technology. Mm -hmm. If there is one part of your system that could be built using another technology uh, which is more appropriate for solving that particular problem, you can do that if you decompose your system in uh, separate parts. Mm -hmm. Another advantage is that uh, different microservices, they could have different across functional requirements. For instance, scal scalability or you know, performance or, or uh, security. Mm -hmm. So you can deal with that when you have this separation. And another <clears throat> advantage that I like a lot is that you can build separate teams to be responsible for separate services. And they can manage smaller applications mm -hmm. better because they are separate, they are smaller, and <clears throat> so that you can build faster and with more quality. Right. So, so what, what, what comes first? Do you decide the architecture first and then you divide your team in smaller teams? Or once you have like a distributed team, it's easier to do a distributed architecture? Which one is? Well, that's an existing discussion. <laughs> There's no like a standard answer for that. There's a lot of discussion uh, even between uh, Martin Fowler and Sam Newman, who were guys that have been talking a lot about microservices nowadays. So... <clears throat> Usually, in most of the places, I have seen people dividing teams by uh, bounded contexts. Mm -hmm. And bounded contexts are business concepts that will define what is a microservice, what is a microservice in your uh, domain. So when you define this bounded context, it, uh, most of the times it makes sense to have a, have a team with that business knowledge and with the capability to develop that application as a service. Okay. But there are variations on that. There are uh, <clears throat> there are some places like in SoundCloud. I've I heard that people are building teams to build features, and those features could like be built across multiple services. So it depends. Really depends on your context and what you're trying to achieve. Okay, that's pretty cool. Now I see that you have like a little uh, demonstration or something. Can can, can you can sure go to the demo a little bit? So we're gonna show. Here are some like some microservices. Yeah, like, so like real the real thing. Yeah. 
Yeah. Let's do it. All right, so Microsoft's run up and running. Let's go. So uh, the talk that we gave on Tuesday uh, was about a new architecture we developed based on microservices and event sourcing. Mm -hmm. So if you are using... We have uh, <clears throat> like uh, BI and anal analytics uh, requirements. We have a lot of uh, requirements for uh, auditing and compliance and legal reasons. So all of those requirements forces forced us to come up with a different architecture for this. Okay. So the idea of this architecture is using the concept of event sourcing, mm -hmm. which is everything that happens in the system, you're going to you're gonna persist in your database as a as an event. Oh, cool! Okay. As a domain event, and then you're gonna have listeners that will listen to that event, and then will uh, keep global consistency in your system. So that changes a little bit how s microservices they communicate. Traditionally, if one service depends on information in another service, that First service will have to arbitrarily send an HTTP request to fetch data, mm -hmm. or at least have a cached version of the information it needs. In that event sourcing model, we're gonna publish events to the, an event bus, mm -hmm. and every service which is interested in that event will have a listener to react when that event happens. Okay. So the difference now is that. Uh, Services, they are totally decoupled. They don't need to know about each other. They mm -hmm. only need to know about this, the events that are in the bus. Right. Once, and for instance, here in I'm this diagram. I'm sure, and I'm sure you can do all, uh, lots of cool things, right? You know, yeah. Like, like uh, uh, put events uh, one after the other or, or multiplex events to different services. I mean, so that's, that's a, a much more uh, interesting architecture than just kind of uh, exactly. accessing directly. Okay. So... <coughs> Yeah, like you said, you can you can do a lot of things, a lot of the interesting interesting things from the point of view of the architecture. So in this diagram, you can see that the service one is publishing an event, and the service two is interested in that event. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that the service two needs to know is the event is the event structure, the right. event payload, and how to deserialize that event. It doesn't matter if the service one is sending that event or if the service ten is is uh, publishing that event. And you can even change who is publishing an event, and it doesn't affect the other applications which depends on that data. Okay. So this is pretty interesting and makes the architecture really open close in the sense that you can easily add and remove things without too much of impact. That's pretty nice. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's 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 uh, uh, seems a, a, a much better, much more scalable, much much easier uh, to manage uh, architecture. Okay. Oh, ex excellent. Yeah. So another thing that uh, we should keep in mind as well is that there are some challenges on this model mm -hmm. too. Right. So the of idea of yeah, go ahead. The idea of the event store, for instance, mm -hmm. when you save events to your event store, you never change one event that happened. Mm -hmm. So that's immutable and it's uh, immortal. You cannot delete an event from the event store, right. and that imposes you some challenges. What if you wanna add an additional field to an event? So what happens with the old events in your event store, right? So you need to come up with a way to map old events to new version of events. And uh, there is another thing, which is what happens if you have a lot of events in your event store and it takes a long time for you to load up everything in the current state of the application. Mm -hmm. So we also have to think about that and come up with snapshot strategies and like indexes and ways to improve the uh, performance in that, uh, in that sense. Okay. So another challenge. Also, the event buzz is kind of like your bottleneck here, right? Yeah, that too. 
Another challenge is that if you have a lot of events in the event bus, that kind of make the listeners to wait until uh, we have like bandwidth to process the events. Right. So those are those are like drawbacks in this architecture. Mm -hmm. But if you can handle that, uh, those uh, <coughs> drawbacks in a way that you can still deliver good quality software, uh, I believe it's a good it's a good approach we to take. Okay, that's pretty nice. So so. Uh, is, do, do you intend to show something running or just, uh, you know, because you, cause you well, have, I, I see that you have an IDE in the back. Yeah, I can, right? I can show you some code. All right. So, yeah, let's, let's take a look at the, at the code of how to do this. Okay. So, when you have an e event sourcing uh, architecture, mm -hmm. everything will happen asynchronously. So, okay. I'm going to show an example in Java here. Mm -hmm. And this is a Spring Boot application. So you can see here, it's just a. It, this is just an example based on like an order and order items, mm -hmm. um, and then you have a, a controller here, and I'm gonna show you an example of creating a new event. Okay. So there's the concept of commands in event sourcing, and commands will generate new events when you when you handle that command and process some business logic. So controllers in this uh, architecture will create commands for the system to process. So here, for instance, we have a create order endpoint. Mm -hmm. And that create order endpoint will create a new create order command. And that will contain the data needed to create a new order. So we have a command gateway here, which is another command bus. It's like the event bus, for a but for commands. Mm -hmm. And for every command you have in this architecture, you have also um, a handler for commands. So there is the create order command, and we have create order command handler. Right. So another important concept in event sourcing are the aggregates. So we have the repository of aggregates, and what the command handler will do here is to load the aggregate from the database. Uh, the meaning of that is uh, to rebuild the current state of the application based on the events that have already happened. Okay. In this case, we don't have any any event on the event start already because we are just creating a new order. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna create this order aggregate, which is just it's just an object that handles the order ID and the order items. Okay. So when you call the constructor, you have this apply method. And this apply method, what it does, it saves a new event to the event store. So the new event here is order created event. So we, we run some business logic here just to, for validation. And if everything goes well, we just save the event to the event store. And that gets automatically published to the event bus. And once this event is in the event bus, abstractions needed for implementing an event source system. So we've been using that in my current project, and it helps us a lot to, to save us from writing code to uh, adapt, uh, to create the uh, event store, to handle the commands and events, and to have the concept of uh, uh, distributed command uh, handler, command gateway, and, and event bus. So it saves us a lot of uh, time by providing those abstractions and and uh, capabilities for us already, so that's the basic flow of the event sourcing uh, data, you know, the data flow of the event sourcing architecture. And another interesting thing that we use in our system is CQRS. CQRS is a is a pattern. It, it's a, it it means like command query responsibility segregation. So the goal here is to have a separate model for writing data to the system uh, than the model for
for reading data from the system. Why we, why we need that? Because it's really hard to read and perform joins and complex queries in the event store because it's just a sequence of events. Okay. So based on the events that happen, we're going to build projections, which, which is the query database. Okay. So in our, in our case, for instance, we have usually um, an, an Oracle database to save all the events, and we also have a projection that could be in MongoDB or mm -hmm. could be another SQL database. And sometimes we send some events to Hadoop in order for us to perform BI and anal analytics analysis mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So CQRS is an important component in this. Right, then, then, then you decide what, what are the events that you want to save on, on, on this to, to analyze later. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. Yeah, and that's pretty much it. Um, if you want to know more details about event sourcing, I recommend one author, which is called Greg Young. This guy is talking about uh, event sourcing and CQRS a lot lately in conferences, mm -hmm. and I've been following him. And I recommend you guys to take a look on, on his uh, work. It's pretty interesting. Okay, that's pretty nice. So thanks a lot, Vinicius. That's, that was really great. Let me just switch back here. Thank that's you, Bruno. Really great. And I think that, uh, so, so one quick question. Uh, you know, so, so do, you, do you think that developers in general, uh, is, is this the right time for them to start learning microservices, even if their companies are not uh, interested right now? Or they should kind of wait a little bit until things are a little bit, you know, of course, there's some developers already learning because they're on the bleeding edge. But, like, if, if, if the developer, the company is not interested in microservice right now, is there something that people can start doing uh, to modularize some parts of the application or tests or, or like create some small microservice that, that, that work together with the existing applications just to, to experiment or not the time yet? Well, I would say that microservices are becoming an, uh, a, a standard mm -hmm. lately because every time you have a, an application which is large enough for you to have problems adding new features on it, maybe it's a good time to think about dividing it in bounded contexts, right? right? So even if you are working on a, co on a, on a project or on a team which uh, you do not have microservices, Maybe at some point, this is always an opportunity for you to question mm -hmm. uh, your current situation and see, hey, uh, would we get some benefit dividing this large application in smaller pieces? So this is always a, a good thing for you to do, right? So I highly recommend everyone to take a look. And I also recommend the uh, San Newman book. I've, I recently read that book, which is really good because it gives you a uh, overall context on microservices and uh, ways to accomplish it fast. So, yeah, I think it's a good idea. Excellent. Okay, so that's Vinicius Gomez. Thanks, thanks a lot, Vinicius. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you.